text, as I indicated, uh, brethren, is uh, Joel 2 and the verses 12 and 13. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, uh, turn ye even unto me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. There's a crisis within evangelical churches uh, today, occasioned by what might be described as cheap grace. The message that comes from many evangelical pul pulpits today is that God loves men and women unconditionally and that they are acceptable to him no matter what they have done and no matter how they live. And no mention is made, though, of the necessity of repentance. Faith in Jesus Christ is too often defined simply as a fleeing to Christ for salvation. But little or no attention is paid to the need for a fleeing from sin in genuine heartfelt repentance. Genuine heartfelt repentance is fundamental to the Christian life. In fact, it is essential to salvation. Our Lord underscores that truth in Luke 13 and uh, verses 3 and 5, where twice uh, he declares, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's not to say that we are forgiven on the basis of or on account of our repentance. Repentance is not the ground of our justification. Our justification is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith alone is the instrument by which the believer receives and rests upon Jesus Christ for their salvation. But a living faith does not exist where there is no genuine repentance. What is repentance? Well, we could do no better, I think, than to turn to the words of the Westminster Larger Catechism in question 76. Now, there we have this statement as regards repentance. Repentance unto life is a saving grace wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit of God and the Word of God whereby out of the sight and sense not only of the danger but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins and upon apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ to such as a penitent, he so grieves for and hates his sins as that he turns from them all to God, purposing and endeavouring constantly to walk with him in all the ways of new obedience. Genuine repentance, as is made plain by that description of repentance in the Westminster Larger Catechism, genuine repentance is much more than a natural feeling of sorrow that men and women often experience over some wrong that they have done, but which they later come to regret. Uh, men and women frequently experience a sense of sorrow on account of uh, the difficulties and the troubles and the consequences that flow from their sinful conduct. Sometimes those uh, consequences flow to them, sometimes those consequences flow uh, to others. But whatever the result is, sometimes when we are confronted with those things, uh, there is a, a genuine sense of sorrow uh, for those things, a sense of regret as to the consequences uh, that flow from our sin. 
And it's true that at times that sense of regret may be keenly felt, uh, but that sense of regret, no matter how keenly felt, uh, does not equate to genuine repentance. Genuine repentance is a gift of God, wrought in our hearts by the Spirit and Word of God. It arises from hearts that have been broken as a result of becoming acutely aware of how awful our sins really are and that they are, in fact, an offence against a righteous and holy God. And so being awakened to the awfulness of our sins, uh, those in whom there has been a work of God's grace come to detest those sins. And not only do they detest those sins, but they turn from those sins. And furthermore, they turn unto God. And they, by God's grace, seek to live in a way henceforward that is acceptable uh, to him. Brethren, the capacity that we have for sin is enormous. And too often, uh, we have a deeply distorted view of our own righteousness. Uh, we, we are prone uh, to minimise our sin. We're prone to excuse our sin. Uh, we can see sin in others, but we struggle to see sin in our souls and this this desire as it were to accommodate uh, really what is the spirit of our age has seen uh, the development of what one might describe as a feel-good ministry a ministry that strokes the ego but which fails to confront sinners with the true nature of their sins uh, such, such a ministry is a ministry, ministry that is severely deficient. You see, as Christians, we need to be able to be confronted with our sins. We need to be able to recognise our sins. We need to be able to make a sober evaluation of our conduct in the light of God's word. Otherwise, if we can't do that, we will never be brought to the place of genuine repentance. It's only as we are brought by the Spirit of God to see the nature and awfulness of our sins that we will ever turn from them unto God and that we will ever seek to live in the way of new obedience. It was to genuine heartfelt repentance that the Lord called the children of Judah through the prophet of Joel, when he said to them, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. If you wanted a description, a biblical description of repentance, there you find it in Joel chapter 2. Let's uh, look at this word of God in this morning under this theme, Rend your heart and not your garments. So divide the sermon under these headings, the urgent call, secondly, the explicit requirement, and then finally, the gracious encouragement. Uh, just by way of a very brief overview, Scripture reveals or supplies very little information about the prophet Joel. Uh, his name means uh, literally Jehovah is God, and in general terms, that was the message that Joel was called to bring to the children of Judah. And though there are some differences of view among commentators, it appears that Joel engaged in his prophetic ministry during the reign of Joash, king of Judah. You may be familiar with Joash. Uh, he was one of the uh, godly kings of Judah. And Joash was the eighth king of Judah, reigned over Judah uh, during the period of 835 through to 796 BC. And Joel's prophecy uh, to Judah was primarily one of judgment, warning as he did of the coming day of the Lord. Significantly, Joel's prophecy to Judah followed shortly after Judah had been ravaged 
by a plague of insects and uh, worms and, and, and other, other uh, critters such as caterpillars. Uh, as Joel, Joel declares, this uh, plague of insects and worms have been sent by the Lord. In uh, Joel uh, 2.25 you read, uh, Joel speaks of the restoring of Judah. He speaks of restoring the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. And then he goes on to refer to uh, those uh, insects and uh, worms as the great army which God had sent among them. That great natural army of the Lord, you see, had brought utter devastation to Judah. The combination of the locusts and different types of worms and caterpillars had destroyed the very fabric of Judah's economy as effectively as any army of men could have done. In a matter of uh, uh, days, if not hours, the fields of Judah had been stripped bare, crops destroyed, pastures uh, denuded, trees uh, defoliated. Nothing was spared and the devastation was comprehensive. Uh, you read in chapter 1 and verse 4 of Joel, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left the canker worm has eaten and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. And as a result, Judah had been brought to her knees. Uh, we uh, read in uh, chapter 1, 10 through 12, the field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new, new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. And goes on and describes all of the effects that this uh, natural army of the Lord had uh, brought upon uh, the land of Judah. And the, the evident indication is that none of the crops, none of the grasses, none of the trees, none of the plants had remained untouched by that great army of the Lord. And as a result, both man and beast were left without food. Uh, everywhere there was dev devastation. The decimation of the land was complete. Uh, even so complete, in fact, that the children of Israel had nothing uh, to bring uh, to the Lord by way of sacrifice. As Joel uh, reveals, this great natural army of the Lord uh, prefigured the coming day of the Lord. And under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, God, Joel revealed to the children of Israel, or specifically to the children of Judah, that the coming day of the Lord would result in even greater devastation. Uh, that's what we're reading about there in the first three verses of chapter 2, where he speaks about, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the, of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. And then goes on to describe the awfulness and the terribleness of that day. Significantly, Joel's prophecy to the children of Israel not only warned, though, about impending judgment, but it also called them to repentance. And that's what uh, verses 12 and 13 are directed towards. It's directed towards uh, Judah's repentance. Uh, the grounds for this call of Judah to repentance uh, was the sin of Judah. That's evident from the words of our text. The fact that the Lord calls Judah to turn unto him implies that Judah had actually turned away from him. Notice he says, Turn ye even to me. Turn unto the Lord your God. You see, these were dark days in Judah, dark days that had their origins in the reign of Jehoram, the son of the godly Jehoshaphat. Jehoram had reigned over Judah for some eight years. And during his relatively short reign, he led the children of Judah into apostasy and idolatry. In 2 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 11, Scripture provides this epitaph of Jehoram. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains 
of Judah and cause the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication. Spiritual fornication is what's being referred to there and compel Judah thereto. The spiritual decline in Judah that had its beginnings during the reign of Jehoram uh, continued to be fostered by his son, Ahaziah. We read of Ahaziah this morning in 2 Kings 11. So following the death of Jehoram, Ahaziah, his son, reigns, and he reigned for only a very uh, short period of time. And after Ahaziah, Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, seized the throne of Judah, and she reigned for some six years. Significantly, uh, Athaliah, of course, was not only the mother of Ahaziah, but she was also the daughter of the ungodly Ahab, king of Israel. Uh, it was, she was the daughter of Ahab, of course, who had, with the assistance of Jezebel, introduced the worship of Baal into the ten northern tribes of Israel. And so it comes as no surprise to learn that Athaliah, during her six years of reign, also introduced the worship of Baal into uh, the southern tribes of Israel, into Judah. And we're told in 2 Chronicles 21 and verse 6 that she walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. And that means that she walked in the ways of the worship of Baal. And so under Athaliah's reign, the worship of Baal flourished in Judah. Her reign came to an end, as we read this morning in 2 Kings 11, when Joash, the son of Ahaziah, who had been preserved from Athaliah's purging of the royal seed, was enthroned with the assistance of Jehoiada, the high priest. Joash, as we read too in 2 Kings 11, at that time was only seven years of age. Interestingly and significantly, uh, so far as our consideration of Joel's call to uh, Judah to repent is concerned, during the reign of Joash, under the superintendence of Jehoiada, Reformation came to Judah. And that was real, there was real Reformation in Judah under the reign of Joash. Uh, in 2 Kings 11 verse 18, as we read this morning, uh, the temple of Baal was destroyed under the reign of Joash. The priests of Baal were put to death during his reign also. Furthermore, we see in the reign of Joash that the temple of God was repaired. And so a radical transformation, a radical spiritual transformation actually took place in Judah during Joash's reign. Given the significant reformation that followed Joash's ascension to the throne of Judah, one might wonder why the Lord still brought the plague of locusts and caterpillars upon Judah. Why subject Judah to such devastation? Uh, furthermore, why the need for the warning of impending judgment? And why here in our text is the Lord, through Joel, call the children of Judah to repentance? Was not Judah's repentance already evident? After all, Judah had renounced the worship of Baal and returned, had they not, to the worship of the Lord. In that regard, it is interesting to note that the prophecy of Joel makes no specific reference to the actual sins of Judah on account of which the judgment of God came upon them. What was Judah's sin? Why the devastating judgment of the Lord upon them? Judah's sin is indicated by the Lord's command to her through Joel. Turn ye even to me with all your heart. In those words, with all your heart, lies the clue to Judah's great sin. 
Though there had outwardly been reformation in Judah under the reign of Joash, the truth was that the children of Judah had not turned unto the Lord with all their heart. Yes, the worship of Baal had been set aside. The temple of the Lord had been repaired and the worship of God had been reinstituted. But the truth was that idolatry remained. Idolatry remained uh, in the hearts of many in Judah. The children of Judah, you see, were duplicitous. They had reformed outwardly, but not inwardly. The hearts of the people, that's not head for head, but the hearts of many of the people were still far from God. That's evident from the fact that Judah maintained her high places. We read in 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, and Jehoash, or Joash, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But then notice how that verse ends. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. What were these high places? Well, these high places were places of idolatry. They were usually located on the tops of hills, usually surrounded by groves of trees so as to hide what was going on there from the prying, from prying eyes. And what was going on there in these high places was the ongoing worship of Baal. On those high hills, the children of Judah engaged secretly in idolatrous worship. The continued existence of the high places testifies to the ongoing idolatry that existed among the children of Judah. The temple of Baal uh, may have been destroyed, but the children of Judah had not abandoned their idolatrous practices, at least not altogether. Judah had returned to the Lord in an outward, external sense, but in truth the hearts of the people were far from the Lord. Their outward actions did not reflect an inward change of heart. The Lord was not uppermost in their thoughts. They did not live, uh, despite the outward appearance, they did not live in conscious dependence upon the Lord. They did not live for the glory and praise of God. The children of Judah, you see, were actually engaged uh, in a subterfuge. Uh, Their repentance, their apparent repentance was feigned. Consequently, their worship was insincere. It was hypocritical. It should be appreciated that it was not the case at this juncture in the history of Judah that widespread outward idolatry was being practised in Judah. It's true to say that the priests no longer connived in such uh, worship. And it's true also that the open wickedness of Jehoram Ahaziah and Athaliah had been removed and large portions of the worship of Baal had been rooted out and the children of Judah were again worshipping the Lord. They were attending the temple and they were bringing their sacrifices unto the Lord. Uh, But not all were doing that and even those that were doing that were not altogether sincere. An outward reformation had taken place, uh, taken place really under the God-fearing Jehoiada, but there had been no true spiritual reformation in the hearts of the children of Judah. But this was the issue with Judah is not only clearly implied in the words of our text when the Lord says to them, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Uh, but the same issue is actually raised in uh, the latter part of our text when Joel adds and rend your heart 
and not your garments. You see, the children of Judah are actually engaged uh, in literally in the rending or tearing of their garments. And the rending or tearing of their garments symbolised sorrow for sin. This was an outward formal show of sorrow over their sins. It was an outward formal repentance. And in all likelihood, that outward demonstration of sorrow was accompanied by fasting and a great show of weeping and of mourning. All outward signs of sorrow and grief over sin. And perhaps they even clothed themselves in sackcloth and ashes. All these outward displays of sorrow and, and grief were designed to indicate the children of Judah's inner sorrow concerning their sins. But notwithstanding that great outward uh, demonstration of grief and sorrow, there was actually no true rending or tearing of the heart among the people. The children of Judah's sorrow of their sins did not arise from broken and contrite hearts. Indeed, the people's sins did not occasion them any real grief of heart at all. Judah's repentance, her outward uh, repentance, was impressive, but it was not genuine. Judah's sorrow and its manifestation were external. The outward expressions of repentance were not matched by a genuine heart of sorrow arising out of a serious consideration of their sins. Children of Judah rent their garments, uh, but they did not rend their hearts. Their hearts, their inner man, their minds, their emotions, their will remained impervious and unmoved and unchanged. Now, brother, this approach to sin uh, is not only to be found among uh, the children of Judah. Uh, the truth is that we can be just like the children of Judah. Careful self-examination uh, will reveal the same attitude of heart and mind in us at times. Uh, we, in fact, frequently engage in the same outward, apparent uh, repentance, but we can also, as was due to engage in truth in a subterfuge. Like the children of Judah, we are sinners. Indeed, like the children of Judah, we are also prone to idolatry. Now, we don't worship uh, stocks and blocks. So idolatry is alive and well, of course, in uh, the church world today. And we're not immune from that. Uh, there are many idols with which we are all uh, well familiar, and perhaps even idols at times uh, we bow down to the idols of money, of wealth, possessions, pleasure, popularity, power, influence, recognition, self-interest, enormous list of, uh, of gods. And as I say, at times we worship those gods. We fall down before those gods. They have a place in our lives, in our homes, in our families. Uh, and we engage in the worship of them, uh, not openly, uh, but we do so secretly. And like the children of Judah... We have our secret high places. And like the children of Judah, we worship the Lord. We're here on Lord's Day. Uh, perhaps even in our homes, we uh, open the scriptures, we read the scriptures, we pray. And so we engage in uh, an outward appearance of uh, genuine uh, Christianity and genuine sorrow over our sins. We pray, we profess a love for God, we even acknowledge the necessity of repentance. We make the right noises and we express the appropriate sentiments. Uh, who among us would not say that we have a need to repent of our sins? But we would all say that. 
But the question is, do we actually do that? Do we actually genuinely repent of our sins? Or are we like the children of Judah in that we rend our figurative garments but not our hearts? Uh, Who would know? Who would know? All of us can be deceived uh, by an outward show of piety. Perhaps we even deceive ourselves at times uh, by our outward uh, behaviour and outward sign or show of piety. The appropriate bowing of the head, a suitably solemn manner. Brethren, we must not simply engage in outward repentance. Genuine repentance is what is required. And genuine repentance arises from contrite hearts. Hearts that love God. Hearts that are genuinely grieved over our sins. Brother, do you know that? And I asked myself the same question. Do, do we genuinely grieve over our sins? I think we, we certainly perhaps acknowledge our sins. We confess that we are sinners. Uh, but do we genuinely grieve over our sins? Do we see our sins as uh, highly offensive to a righteous and holy God? We may deceive others. We may hide the true state of our hearts uh, from others in the church and from the elders, from our fellow saints. But brethren, we can't hide the true state of our hearts from the Lord. Judah couldn't hide the true state of her heart from the Lord. Joel's call to the children of Judah was a call to genuine, heartfelt repentance. He urged the children of Judah in the very depth of their beings to turn unto the Lord. Note that this was not simply uh, the word of Joel, but this was very plainly the the word of the Lord himself. Uh, We find that in our text, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Joel called Judah to repentance, but more significantly, the Lord called Judah to heartfelt repentance, to heartfelt recognition of their sins. He called them to turn from their sins, to turn back from their sins. And he called them, notice, to turn unto himself. There is a danger that despite uh, such a call from the Lord to repent, there is a danger that we can simply go on rebelliously in our sins, as though we simply don't hear uh, what the Lord actually says to us. Uh, So that we're just simply... Uh, those who are openly disobedient uh, to the Lord's call to repent of our sins, with the result that we defiantly continue on in our sins. Now that's a possibility that the, that our response to the, the Lord's call to repentance is one of open defiance. Um, but perhaps the greater danger and the more subtle danger is the one that we find here in the book of Joel, which is that we repent outwardly. But there is our outward change. We make some adjustments, but there's actually no genuine inward change of the heart. We change outwardly, perhaps because of external pressures. We change outwardly because of the need for outward conformity. 
Am I changed outwardly because of the expectations of the church or the expectation of our fellow saints? Am I changed outwardly perhaps because of pressure from our parents or from our peers? Yet in our hearts, we remain the same. There is no turning inwardly from our sins. In our hearts, our sins find a safe haven. And we maintain our inward desire after those sins. And we even cultivate those sins. And we feed them in secrecy. Just as the children of Judah did in the high places. Without doubt, genuine repentance will result in outward change. But it also must be accompanied by a change of heart. In fact, the change of heart is what drives the outward change. Notice what Joel says, Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And what that indicates is that there will be an outward manifestation of repentance. We will fast, we will weep, we will mourn, all of which are outward manifestations of grief and sorrow and indeed of repentance. But those things will also be accompanied indeed. They, as I've already mentioned, they will actually flow from a rending of our hearts. Genuine repentance arises from the rending of our hearts. And then the question comes, how can we rend our hearts? And the truth is that you and I can't rend our hearts. Genuine repentance is a gift of God. Uh, you get an indication of that from other parts of the scriptures too. There's a beautiful uh, passage in Zechariah chapter 12 and uh, verse 10 where Zechariah uh, brings this message. He says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that we won't go into it, but that the, the description there is that it's through the work of the Spirit of God, through the Spirit of grace, uh, that we are brought to the place where, as uh, Zachariah speaks about, we actually look upon Jesus Christ and we see, we see how that uh, we are the ones that have pierced him and it causes us to mourn. And we mourn in such, such bitterness because it's as though we have... Uh, uh, cause the death of our only son. But then repentance is the work of the Spirit of God. Uh, if you do not know of genuine repentance, uh, if you don't know of genuine sorrow over your sins, uh, what we need to do is actually seek the Lord. That we need to pray and beseech the Lord that he would grant unto us genuine repentance of our heart we might actually be enabled to truly recognise the significance and the seriousness of our sins, to appreciate just how ugly and how offensive they are. And furthermore, we need to pray that we might be enabled to take hold of God's mercy, God's mercy manifest to us in Jesus Christ so that we might grieve over and actually hate our sins. And furthermore, that we might then, by God's grace, turn from those sins and that we might then seek to walk in the way of new obedience. They're the, they're the two aspects, really, of repentance. Repentance is recognition of our sins, a turning from those sins. But not just a turning from the sins, it's actually a turning unto God. We need to turn from our sins 
and we need to turn unto God. It's like as though we're walking in one direction and the revelation comes to us of the awfulness of our sins and we do an about face and we walk in exactly the uh, opposite direction. As we uh, contemplate that, brethren, we should do that uh, with the words of encouragement of of, uh, Joel here uh, ringing in our ears. Uh, Notice what he says here. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. And he goes on to say this, for he, that is the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Uh, therefore, there could perhaps even be translated yet, or yet even now. And so the Lord says to Judah, and he says to us, despite all that you have done, despite the hypocrisy that you have displayed, despite your continued disobedience, despite the number of times that you have purported to repent but have not done so with sincerity of heart, yet even now, yet even now, turn ye even unto me with all your heart. Turn unto me against whom you have sinned. Turn to me whom you have despised. Turn to me whom you have sought to deceive. Turn unto me. And then Joel supplies there the reason, the reason drawn uh, from the very nature and character of God as to why we should do that. For, here's the reason, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repents of the, him of the evil. What an extraordinary description of our God. Gracious. He's easy to be entreated. He's ready to forgive. Merciful. That is, he's compassionate. uh, Willing to show uh, pity. Ready to pardon. Willing to relieve the poor and the needy. Slow to anger. He does not enter into judgment hastily or quickly. But he bears long. He's long suffering. He has spared and he continues to spare those who deserve his wrath. On many occasions he has been justified in cutting off Judah altogether. I suppose when we apply that to ourselves, brethren, how often uh, would God have been justified in doing the same thing to you and me? Uh, when you think about it, sometimes our, our sins are just so uh, so profound. In a certain sense, we're as thick as bricks uh, when it comes to uh, our sins. We keep doing the same things over and over and over again. And yet the Lord is slow to anger. He's merciful. He's gracious. gracious. He's of great kindness. He's the God of tender mercies. Uh, He loves us when we are most unlovely. He condescends to us uh, when there is no warrant to do so. And he repents him, we are told here, of the evil. He does not change his will, but he wills to change. So the judgment that rightly should fall on us is averted. Brother God's uh, grace and mercy, his slowness to anger, his great kindness and his willingness not to inflict evil was manifested to Judah in the sending of the prophet Joel. The Lord sent Joel to call his wayward people to repentance. And this is also God's purpose in the ministry of the gospel today. 
You know, God is no less gracious. God is no less gracious today than he was in the days of Joel. He's gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness and he repents him of the evil. That's who he is. That's who he is and that's what he will always be. And that grace and mercy, his slowness to anger, his great kindness and his willingness not to inflict evil is most clearly manifested, of course, in the cross of Jesus Christ. You want to see those attributes of uh, God uh, revealed to us, set forth before us? Look to the cross. That's where you see them most evidently set forth in, G- in the sending of Jesus Christ into this world to die upon the cross of Calvary in order that sinners, sinners such as you and I actually might be saved. Extraordinary, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, beyond really comprehension why God would actually send his own son into the world to save sinners uh, such as you and me. He's done that, uh, but, but we ought not to allow the enormity of what he did to escape uh, our thinking. Judah deserved to come under the judgment of God. We deserve to come under the judgment of God. But on account of God's grace and mercy, his slowness to anger, his kindness and his willingness not to inflict evil, all manifested in Jesus Christ. Uh, God caused, in fact, his righteous judgment uh, not to fall upon us, but to fall upon his Son and upon our Saviour. Calvary, Calvary stands as an everlasting monument uh, to God's grace and mercy, his slowness to anger, his great kindness and his willingness not to inflict evil. Brethren, rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, he's merciful, he's slow to anger, he's a God of great kindness, and he repents him of the evil. Amen.